prayer. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word that we can come together and we can be in your presence and in the presence with one another. Lord, we pray that your word would speak, that your spirit would speak, and that you would be present with us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, in today's sermon, I'm going to be working with two metaphors. I know you're not supposed to mix metaphors or use multiple metaphors, but Paul does it all the time, so we'll take that as it's okay for me to do that today. The two metaphors are this. The one is this image of a building, of a place, of a location. And we get this in our passage from Isaiah. We also get it in our passage from Ephesians. And the second is this image of broken pottery, this image of something that's been, that was once together that's now separated. And we get this image in our passage from Ephesians as well. So I don't know about you, but in the recent years, I've been staying at Airbnbs and Vario, or what now is called Verbo, uh, according to the advertisements. Uh, and whenever you go to one, you kind of, you don't know what to expect, right? You show up and there's kind of one of two types of these places. The first is the place that looks like it's prepared for short-term rentals, right? Everything is kind of the lowest grade. Uh, you, know, you're, you know that if you break something, it's not a big deal, that you can just go to Walmart and replace it. It's prepared for people who are just going to be staying for a little while. And the second is when you walk in the door and you realize, I'm staying in somebody's house. And you get that feeling of like, I don't want to move things. I don't want to break things. I don't know where things go, and I need to get it back in the right spot. We had one of those experiences this spring where we went to an Airbnb in Santa Fe, and there was actual artwork on the walls. There was pottery that I was scared my kids were going to break. And there were things in the house that I didn't want to touch and we needed to avoid. What was supposed to be a relaxing vacation quickly turned into, how can we get this thing out of the way from the kids? And often we have that same challenge, right? We have this place where we're staying in somewhere where it's not quite our home and we're afraid of what can be broken. Now, there's another kind of broken things that we're afraid of. We're afraid that we're gonna break something that we can't fix. A few years ago, I got a lamp uh, from my grandfather after he passed away and it was a lamp that I really loved and really kind of in my mind characterized my grandfather. And it broke shortly after I got it. He had probably had it for 40 years and I ended up breaking it in six months. And I kept the parts around for years. We moved them from Boston to houses. We moved them from Boston to Colorado and they sat in a box in the basement. And I thought I was gonna repair it. I even tried to repair it and I just couldn't get it back to normal. I couldn't get it functioning. So there's things that we're afraid that we're gonna break that, are, that aren't ours. And there's things that we've broken that we can't fix. But then there's also another kind of broken things. And this is like our cars. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever worked on your car. I haven't in a while, but this is part of the reason why is because I always seem to have a skill at fixing the wrong thing. That the light comes on, right? And you go and you start fixing things. Oh, I need to fix the brakes. Oh, it wasn't the brakes per se. It was the caliper that was holding the brakes on. And this idea that Oftentimes, we think we're fixing the right thing, but we're actually headed in the wrong direction. And then last, lastly, there are things that are broken in our lives that we don't even know are broken. That sink, that drip, 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 and then you see the pool underneath and there's rotted boards. That you aren't even aware that something has been broken until it's too late. I'm sure many of us feel similar kinds of brokenness in multiple areas of our life. Uh, it's as if we didn't have enough brokenness and pain and physical ailments in 2019. 2020 had to come and show us how much more there was. There's a pandemic that won't go away, reminding us of our frailty and our weakness. And we have political divisiveness over the last few years that makes us feel like there's no hope for our church or for our country. And there's calls for racial justice that have shown us that things that weren't whole, there, there are things that weren't whole, that we thought were whole. That sinful institutions like race-based slavery and race-based laws have a long afterlife. We live in a world 
of broken relationships. And we're constantly being told that our brokenness can be fixed right after this ad from our sponsors. In our American moment, companies, political parties, and even some churches have realized that it's easier to move people to action, which often means to spend their money with outrage, fear, and conspiracy than with faith, hope, and love. In our American moment, we have access to so much information, but also so much misinformation that we can't even hope to be able to process it well without the gospel. Something, sometimes we treat the gospel as if, as if it's something that can break and we can't fix it, that it's never gonna be able to fix, that there's some fault lines that cannot be crossed if once we cross them. And there's some ways of thinking that are irredeemable by the cross. This is not the gospel. Jesus didn't say, come to me unless you've sinned and are a sinner. Then you need to clean up your act, get your thinking right, and make sure you're supporting the right political party. And he didn't say, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will fill you with fear and outrage because if I don't, you won't fight for my kingdom. And then the whole plan of mine is not really going to happen. Right? We know Jesus came and said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Sometimes we think that we are the only ones who can preserve the gospel, the church, or, America, or our American way of life. And that we're called to fight to our dying day to preserve whatever it is we're told that we're afraid of losing this week. First, let me say this. God's not in the business of preserving an American way of life. If that causes you some wrestling, ruffle some feathers, let's talk about it. God will preserve his church independent of us. And the outworking of the gospel has been set in motion since the creation of all things. So there's not much that we can do to mess it up. So then what do we do in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our broken world and our broken relationships? We're going to be in the passage from Ephesians 2 today. Ephesians tells us that it starts with knowing what God has already done. Eugene, put it, Eugene Peterson puts it this way. He says, if we don't know what God thinks of us and what we have to do with God, we've missed a huge part of what it means to grow up. So this is our problem. This is our dilemma. We are living in the midst of brokenness. And if we want to live well in brokenness and be part of God's restoring work through Christ, we have to know who we are and what we have to offer our broken world. So here's the good news. In short, if you take nothing else away, this is it. We are God's creation. And we are recreated for his good work. This is the story of Ephesians. The entire letter is a letter that's telling a church who they are in Christ, that it's telling them what they are supposed to be. Now, if we go back to the beginning of Ephesians, we, we read from last week that Paul is encouraging his non-Jewish audience in what it means to practice the resurrection, what it means to be faithful in Christ. And the reason he had to, he had to do this was because they didn't know. They didn't know what that meant because they hadn't been part of the covenant. They hadn't been part of the people of God, as we saw from our passage today. The first two chapters of Ephesians explain who the church is. And as the rest of the letter goes on, Paul explains what the church is to do, how the church is to live. And so if you look at uh, chapter 1, verses 7 through 10, we see that we have redemption through Christ. And God is uniting all things in Christ. Paul says, in him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mysteries of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So we are part of a people who's being united, that the brokenness that once stood is being torn away. And next in verses 11 through 14, we see that we have an inheritance with God, 
that's sealed through the Holy Spirit, that God is our inheritance and the Spirit is his promise. And then in 15 through 23, we see that Christ is the head of all things and the church is his body. This is a guiding verse, verse 123, for the entire book. He says, and he put all things under his feet. That is, God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him his head over all things, the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And continuing on in verses uh, chapter two, we see that we were once dead. And then we got, have this great phrase in verse four, but God. Whenever we see that phrase, but God, you should pause and stop and see what God's about to do. But God made us alive, that we were dead, that we didn't know what we were doing, that image of we don't even, didn't even know what was broken, but God act, acted. And what did God act, accomplish? Verses 8 through 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship or his craftsmanship. We are the things that are handmade by God, just like pottery, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. Now, when we read that passage, works, oftentimes it's easy to think of a, a Lutheran contrast between works and grace. Now, there is that here. It's explicit in the passage. But probably what uh, Paul is thinking about is this work of following the Jewish law. That the Ephesians are wondering, do we need to practice the Jewish law in order to be part of God's covenant people? And Paul is saying, no, actually you don't. That through Christ, we don't have to do that anymore. And this is where we get into verse 11. And verse 11, we have therefore, in our passage from today, therefore remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh and now you are part of God's people. Remember that you were once separated from Christ, and now you're united with him. Now, again, like but God, whenever we see the word therefore, it's the dumb pastor joke, right? You should ask what it's there for. It's connecting the passage, right? The, the material that came before, that this is who you are so that you should live this way. You should act this way. You should think this way. And what's Paul call us to do? Remember. Remember who we were, that we were once alienated and separated from God, but now we are not. And we remember God's action in our life. And then again in verse 13, we have one of these but now. But now in Christ. This harkens back to the but God's action from before and reminds of, of who we are now. But now in Christ, you who are once far off have been brought near. God has reunited those things that were broken by his blood. For he is our peace. He is the one that unites us with one another. Now, there's a really interesting section here from verses 14 to 18. You may not think it's interesting. I do. Uh, but there's nine active activities of Jesus that go on in these short passages. And you know how many activities of believers or of the church there are? Zero, that their identity in Christ is because of Christ's actions. Just like God's action from before, you were dead and you're made alive. Christ's actions now are the things that bring us together. He is our peace. He broke down dividing walls. He made us one. He abolished the law. He created one new humanity. He made peace. He reconciled. He put to death hostility between those whom he made peace. He proclaimed peace to those who were far off. This is the activity of Jesus who is uniting those things that were broken, bringing together those things that were separated back into unity. And because of this and through him, verse 18, we have access to God the Father, that we have a chance to participate in the divine union, in the divine story, in the divine spreading of the gospel, in Christ. And then we have a so then. So we had therefore, but now, for yet, so then. This is a grammar teacher's, I don't know if it's a nightmare or a, a dream. 
So then you are not strangers and foreigners. And Paul now gives us three things, again, things that are done to us, not things that we get to do, not works that we're trying to do. He says that we are built on a foundation. If you're part of the foundation, we're not doing the building, right? God is doing the building. We are joined together. We are built together. This will harken back to our, our liturgy in a few minutes of the unity of the body, that we are one together and we come to the table together. And what does this all say? It means that God's work makes the church. That when we look at the words, those connecting words, we see that God, through Christ Jesus, is creating the church. That those places of separation and division, those relationships that have been broken, that Christ is the one that's unifying them. There's this ancient Japanese art of restoration called kintsugi. I may have mispronounced that. But um, if you could change the slide. And it's this art of taking broken pottery and restoring it, not just to its original beauty, but actually making it something different and something more beautiful by using gold as the connecting piece, as filling in those spaces, that place where there was brokenness with something precious. And we have such a beautiful image of this in the gospel as well, that Jesus is that one that fills in those broken spaces, those broken relationships, those spaces in our, our friendships, those places in our life where there is brokenness, that it's Christ that fills those. And he fills it not just to restore, not just to reconcile, but actually making something new and something more beautiful. Eugene Peterson says, we acquire our identity, not by what we do, but by what is done to us. We were once a broken piece of pottery and through Christ, we have become something much more beautiful. As individuals, yes, but as a community as well, as a body, as a church. And that body, that church transcends national identity. It transcends ethnic identity. It transcends our cultural moment. It stretches from history past and will stretch to history future. And it's so much bigger than ourselves. And so when we remember what God has done, we can start to see our place not only as this broken thing that has been restored, but also our place in this building. That sometimes it's easy to think that we're living in a house with someone else's stuff in it. And sometimes it really feels like that, that this world feels foreign and distant and a place where we can't quite understand. And that's okay, because we are sojourners, we're pilgrims. This is not our home. But we also need to remember that the stuff that fills our house, the stuff that we have surround, that we live in in this moment, whether it be from our own uh, place, our own location, or the place that we hope to be, that those things do not define us. That those pieces of pottery, those pieces of art, those things that we keep around us in a metaphorical sense are not shaping who we are. That it's actually Christ. Christ is the one who has built us up that Christ is the one who has done the work and nothing we can collect, nothing we can hold on to in this world will matter in the end. And so we remember what God has done and then we know our position, that we were once far off and we've been brought near. And then we know our identity, that we are fellow citizens, that we're members of God's household. We are built together. And in, as we'll say in a moment, we have died together we will rise together and we will live together. We were once far off, but now we're brought near for Christ is our peace. John Ortberg says that peace doesn't come from finding a lake with no storms. It comes from finding Jesus in the boat. And a similar thing that peace in our world, in the world that we live in, in the relationships we have, doesn't come from finding no storms of having no brokenness, but it comes from our presence with Jesus. And this is the type of people we are called to be. We are called to be agents of God's peace. Now, peace uh, is not, let's agree, uh, it's, it's not let's not disagree, right? That's a truce. If we just stand in the same room 
uh, sorry, peace is not let's agree to disagree, right? That's just a truce. If we're standing in the same room and we both say, well, we really disagree on this issue, uh, there's not peace there. That's a truce. Peace is coming together and finding common ground and living in unity. And so when we remember who we are, we are able to live into Christ's peace. And so this week, take some time to give Christ's peace to someone that needs it. Maybe it's yourself. Maybe that moment you open up social media in the morning and you see that thing that gets you all wrapped up, you need to give Christ's peace to yourself. Maybe it's to that person who you may or may not even know that makes you so angry and gets you so frustrated that you just have to vent to someone. Extend Christ's peace. And maybe it's someone that you live with or someone that you've had a fight with over the last year about, I don't know, politics or vaccines or masks or any one of the things that we have been fighting about for the last year. Extend Christ's peace. Ask Christ to be present and to be the restoring glue, the restoring connection of those relationships and see what God does. As Matt always says, God's really good at doing these things that we sometimes don't know what's going to happen. But if we take that step of extending Christ's peace, then we will see him work and we could ask for his work to continue. And maybe it's someone here, maybe in a few minutes when we pass the literal peace of Christ with one another, that you need to seek someone out and extend Christ's peace to them as we come together as a unified body of Christ. And so as we live into who we are as the church, our identity extends well beyond anything the world can offer us because it's rooted in Christ. It's rooted in work that has already been done independent of us, and it's rooted in his peace. May we live into that. Amen.